My name is Dr. Kevin Pekka. I want to make a podcast that exposes people to the true miracles of life and health. All the guests on this show have been specially picked because they bring something positive to the world. They have some of the most amazing and inspiring life stories. These people have a passion for living, healing, and leaving the world better than they found it. There is something inside these people that made them keep fighting through all the tough times, even when people told them it was not possible. They carried on and made their lives beautiful again. And now they are sharing their experiences with the world. This is the Expect Miracles podcast. Enjoy the show. Dr. Jeff Scholten is an upper cervical doctor out of Calgary, Canada. He is an expert in the upper neck, which is called the craniocervical junction, and it is the most vital part of our central nervous system because every single nerve in our body passes through this junction. And if there is any interference in this area, your body is not functioning to its optimal potential. That is exactly why upper cervical chiropractic saved my life and is why so many others, like Dr. Jeff Schulten and myself, are on a mission to share this procedure with the world and get everyone functioning to their optimal potential. Please welcome Dr. Jeff Schulten. Jeff, where are you from? Oh, uh, Canada. So, uh... North of you guys a little bit, and I was born in Ontario and moved out through Saskatchewan to Calgary, but I've been in Calgary since university, and that's where my family is now. I hear it's beautiful out there, especially this time of year, huh? It's gorgeous. We're having a lot of wildfires right now, but it's a beautiful place to come and visit, and we're Calgary's on the, kind of the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, so right by Banff and Lake Louise. I was going to so say, is that the, where Banff is? Because I've seen pictures of that, and that just looks unreal. It's pretty awesome. It's a nice playground to have in our backyard, that's for sure. Air tastes good out here. Yeah, <laughs> the air tastes good. So what were you into as a kid growing up? Playing sports or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I played a lot of soccer. As a Canadian, you'd think I'd play a lot of hockey, but I wasn't any good at hockey. So I grew late. But but yeah, soccer. I played indoor, outdoor. I played a ton of that and a ton of basketball. So those were my sports. You know, really, I mean, they consumed the majority of my time growing up for sure. You ever, uh, you ever run across Steve Nash ever when you were uh, playing basketball? <laughs> Probably good that I didn't, but no. <laughs> so, Jeff, how did you get into the healing profession? When I finished high school, I didn't go straight into university. I kind of didn't know what I exactly wanted to do. So I took a year off. I went over to Amsterdam where my dad's from and I had a lot of family. Lived there for a year and uh, worked on the market selling fruits and vegetables and just you know, sort of experiencing uh, life off the treadmill, I guess, a little bit. And that was an awesome experience. And as I was there, I realized, okay, yeah, ready to continue on with uh, higher education. And, and I figured I'd go into business. So I started into commerce. And by the end of the first year, just really kind of found it wasn't very inspiring for me. It hadn't, school hadn't been inspiring up until that point, And that was no different. And are you still so in I, Amsterdam at this point? No, I'm in Calgary. So I came back to Calgary from Amsterdam and uh, and started university. At the end of the first year, then I realized uh, maybe I'd do something different. So I moved over to uh, kinesiology and started taking some courses in kines. Just dropped all my courses on the first day of class and started auditing them and then registered in the third. And that was an interesting thing for me because one of the classes that I registered in, a guy named Dale Butterwick was a prof of athletic therapy class. And and uh, one of the things he said on the first day is he said, you know, a lot of the classes you take, nobody's ever going to ask you anything about. They don't need you to know anything about it. But this athletic therapy thing, when people hear you take it, they're going to start asking you questions about problems that they have. And if you know this information, you're going to be able to help them. And if you don't know this information, then you won't. It's pretty simple, <laughs> you know? And I was like, oh, that's kind of a cool idea, right? So then I decided, well, why don't I just study this information? And at the same time, I was taking some biomechanics classes, some anatomy classes. Those were really interesting to me as well. And so I found that studying wasn't, for the first time in my life, really studying wasn't that painful. And I enjoyed what I was learning. And so I did all the athletic therapy classes that I could, really enjoyed that, working as an athletic therapist, a student athletic therapist anyway, through my undergrad. And right around second year, I guess, my sister, who was uh, at the time 16 and had had a stroke when she was five and was hemiparetic, so only one side of her muscles worked normally on the other side had an upper motor neuron lesion basically and constant spasm, had created an imbalance, an asymmetry in her musculature enough that it had created a pretty enormous scoliosis for her. 
And so, yeah, my parents kind of researchers, so they just continued to research things. And eventually they found Nuka, a guy by the name of Alberti, who was the Nuka president at the time. And Jeff, what is Nuka? Nuka is the set of procedures developed by an organization known as the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. And so in chiropractic, basically around the turn of the century, chiropractors started taking x-rays, like 1912, I think it was, and then gradually started focusing on the upper cervical spine. And as that developed over the next few decades, different sub-procedures started to develop as people took it in different directions. And one of the directions was, it was taken was by a guy named John Grostick, who eventually joined by a guy named Ralph Gregory. And they were just looking at the way to correct the spine, taking pre-x-rays, determining the position of the vertebra, and trying to reduce the imbalances back to a more neutral position. And then after John Grostick died, There was a number of organizations that were formed out of people that had been studying with him. And one of them was NUCA, formed in Michigan by Ralph Gregory. And so NUCA has been around now as an organization for 50 years. Uh, The Grostick work is coming up on 70 years. And it just continues to develop. Even at the very last conference, there was a new part to the analysis. I won't bore you with details, but that had been studied and, and then incorporated into the work. And so... What's really cool about NUCA is its ongoing development. I mean, it's not a fast developing procedure because there's lots of people that are doing it. and It's done a lot of historical development, but it continues to take information that its practitioners find, study that information, and if it makes the reduction better or the analysis more precise, then it's incorporated into the procedure. So that's NUCA. And so, so your going, sister came across this when she was about 16 years old? That's right, yeah. So going back to that, my sister was 16. My parents came across it, and so I took her out there, hoping to reduce the effects of this massive muscular imbalance in her body. And yeah, so when she's out of alignment, she has a leg that's about an inch and a half short. And then when she's in alignment, it's even. And so that was a pretty profound effect that he had on her, was able to even her leg length and balance her hips and and do it all through the upper neck. And as somebody at that time studying anatomy and uh, physiology and biomechanics and having an interest in that area, that was very interesting to me. And so he then transferred her back to uh, Calgary where there were two nuclear practitioners, one by the name of Gordon Hasek and one by the name of Gary Thompson. And in the end, I ended up going in and chatting with Gary Thompson. He was nice enough to make some time for me. And uh, so I went and chatted with him. And as I spoke with him and observed what he was doing, it it just seemed really, really inspiring to me to be able to uh, make that kind of a difference in somebody's life. Just to drastically, yeah, change someone's life for the better. You see miracles happen every day with upper cervical. It's unbelievable. It's one of those funny things that almost becomes commonplace. You know, I think. Yeah, yeah. When I started practice, there was a psychiatrist down the hall from me who had a lot of interest actually in alternative medicine, did a lot of acupuncture and that kind of stuff. And and so he would take me out to lunch. He kind of took me under his wing, I guess, a little bit and would buy me lunch periodically and give me (laughs) advice. And a great guy, his name is Bud Ricky. And he said, you know, Jeff, the challenge in practice is to concentrate on the 95 and not the five. And I think it's interesting in our practices, I, I don't know that we have the five even. But there's certainly maybe the one and a half percent that on a day-to-day basis, we don't have the kind of results that they want or that we want. But really, it baffles me every day, the changes that people are able to see in their lives and their ability to exist in a healthy way. It changes the entire family's life too. Because now that this person's struggling, the whole family feels it and you, that person's life changes for the better and the whole family is better for it. That's also awesome to see in practice as well. Yeah, it it absolutely is. I mean, you know, when I started in practice, Kevin, I I was seeing all these changes and I really didn't understand when somebody would come in and say, can you help me with this issue or this issue? I didn't have any ability to kind of have a sense of whether we would be able to help them. The likelihood was so high that, of course, most people were finding some kind of positive effect. I just didn't know what that was. So after I was in practice for two and a half years, I actually did a retrospective analysis of all of my patients and all of their outcomes after seven weeks under our care. And it's just incredible, you know, the average reduction in postural imbalance was 83% within two or three days. And that was only because I only checked them again two or three days later. Yeah, very Uh, true. Then I did 
looking at the symptoms and, and what their experience was symptomatically, you know, we have a really interesting relationship with symptoms in upper cervical because we, we're looking for something that could be the underlying cause of so many different things. I mean, with the hierarchy of neurology that's in the body, you know, you have an injury to your low back that's catastrophic and boy, that really makes a dent in your life. And uh, in your yeah. neck, if you have the same injury, it, it's a huge deal, right? It's, yep. it, it includes all the issues that would be in your lower back but injury, but, but even more. But boy, that upper neck, that craniocervical junction, the area between the skull and that first, second vertebra, if you injure that catastrophically, you're pretty much instantly dead. And so if you've injured it, but it's not catastrophic in nature, so you're still alive, you know, that idea that there's a continuum between things being absolutely how they're supposed to be and things being so bad that you could be dead leaves you kind of with a breadth of possibility yeah. Uh, between those two points of what it could affect in a human being in terms of this progressive deterioration that often happens. Sometimes people will have an injury, as you know, and immediately have a symptomatic experience associated with it. And they can tell, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I had a patient come in yesterday who's on a six-month recall schedule because she gets only adjusted every couple of years. She's been under care for probably about a decade. And she came in and she said, I bumped my head getting into my car. And I uh, didn't think much of it. It was just a little bump. And then a couple weeks later, my low back started hurting. My sacroiliac joint, the SI joint, that pelvic joint at the back, lower back, the bottom part of the lower back. And uh, she's like, I didn't clue in. I said, oh, what's going on here? You know, she hadn't been in for a number of months and she hadn't been adjusted for a really long time. And finally, about a month and a half after having experienced this pain and it kind of being there, present, consistently, all of a sudden a light bulb went off in her head. She said, she said, wait a second, this is the problem I get when I have my neck out of alignment, yeah, right? Yeah. And that speaks to the difficulty I think we have with patients to a certain extent because the neck obviously spinally is as far removed from the sacroiliac joint as possible. But when, the neck, but when the neck goes off and all of a sudden the body starts being inhibited or negatively affected in its ability to communicate, then for us, you know, we'll see a whole range of things, right? We'll see the blood flow differentials happen. Absolutely. But we'll also see a lot of postural asymmetry. And as she started walking with that postural asymmetry, that eventually recreated her original Right. Experience. Well, it's the most unstable area in the body with the most neurological significance, correct? That's it. So, I mean, every single nerve in your body passes through that foramen up there and it literally can affect anything. It's just unbelievable. Totally. So that's why it's an interesting thing because as you get into this stuff and, you know, I saw this stuff happen with my sister and I thought, oh, that's really cool. That'd be something I could get into doing for people. You know, I, I already knew I wanted to move on into some form of helping people. I didn't know what it was going to be. And then these things come across you. It's really fortuitous. It's a kind of fluky, right, in a way that you uh, sometimes that you come across this stuff. Because in our practices, we see people who, man, if I could have only known about this 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know. Everybody but, says that, yeah. Yeah. So I was really lucky that way. And so then I got under care and I could feel real substantial shifts in my body. I could just, I was in a very different place and uh, I wasn't a highly symptomatic person, but I would periodically have issues. And mostly what it was, was I could feel my body sort of shifting structurally. And, and I thought that was pretty cool. And my wife, who at that time we were dating, she would have a headache or stomach ache here or there. I was planning on doing this chiropractic thing and she'd never been to a chiropractor. So she decided she'd go in and she gets adjusted. Her nose starts running, ran for like three days. And then a few weeks later, she realized, wait a second, I don't have to use my uh, bronchodilator anymore when I uh, nose spray. Like she had had asthma pretty significantly for a couple of years ever since she had had uh, a bronchitis that was mistreated with uh, antibiotics from different practitioners for about a year without anybody asking her if she'd been on them before until one guy did, a young doc did and took her off them. But she basically had this ongoing bronchitis for a year that uh, eventually healed after she came off the antibiotics, but he took her off of them and then she was left with this asthma. So for a couple of years, she had this condition where she was uh, dealing with asthma. And anyway, so what she said is that even before she had this bronchitis and ended up with the asthma, once she could actually breathe after she had her first nuca correction, 
she said thought for the, her entire life she probably had limited ability to intake air she just thought it was her normal so she didn't know and then when she would lose her alignment she would notice she wouldn't go back to an asthmatic level of loss of air but she would notice that she just had a bit of restricted breathing she couldn't breathe quite as clearly and well and that's how she knew that she was out of alignment yeah so then you know you get now the next person is my brother-in-law who's got uh, asthma so he's like, oh, well, I, you know, I've tried chiropractic for asthma and uh, it didn't work. And I'm like, well, we don't really treat asthma. We just fix the neck. And if the neck's causing the asthma, then the asthma goes away. If there's some other issue causing the asthma, and there could be lots of reasons you might have asthma, then the asthma doesn't go away. It's not that the neck wasn't an important thing to get fixed anyway. Right. And so he comes in, he gets treated, and his asthma has no change. But what he finds is that his migraines that he suffered from for his entire life go away. He came for the asthma. Right? So his migraines are gone. Now he has an issue and he's still under care now and he comes in periodically. He knows he's out of alignment because he starts to get a cold sore. Really? On his lip. He used to have cold sores all the time. As soon as he starts to get a cold sore, he knows he's off and it doesn't get full blown. He can just feel like some sort of, I don't get cold sores, so I don't know, but like some tingling, right? And then he comes in, gets adjusted. Cold sores are gone. And cold sores <laughs> stops coming on. So he's noticed that over like now decades that that's related. And it's such an interesting thing when you start watching these variety of symptoms because what it basically is is the inability for the body to fully express itself and fully self-maintain, right? Optimally. And so when we're dealing with this particular situations, people come in with all sorts of things and they're looking for help with those things usually. Some people are just coming in to optimize their postural asymmetry. I mean, I had a... A guy in yesterday whose parents were patients, he's been a patient. I mean, I've been in practice now 16 years and a little bit. And he started with me 15 years ago as a teenager. Now he's married. He just recently got married. And he was in, and it's been, he got checked. He's on a three-month schedule. So he got checked three months ago. He's holding. And so now he's on, he was holding yesterday. And, and Jeff, like, uh, gotta... for those listening, what do you mean by holding? Because it's a different concept within chiropractic that most people don't yeah, know about. That's a great point, Kevin. Yeah, so basically the idea for us is that we want to adjust you if you have factors, misalignment factors that are subluxation factors, what we would call misalignment of the vertebra when it kind of affects you uh, neurologically and affects your brain to body communication. And, and so when that's happening, that's when we adjust. So we monitor a bunch of objective findings to try to understand if a person is in need of an adjustment or if they're not in need of an adjustment and their body's functioning well. And the job is, from our perspective, is to adjust people as little as possible to get them the best results. So when somebody holds their alignment really well, we'll gradually space out their appointments depending on basically their frequency. And uh, so this guy, he was coming in for a checkup and everything was good. He felt good and all of his objective findings, his thermography, posture, how his back was moving, what the musculature felt like, what his joints felt like. Everything was good. And and so he didn't need an adjustment. So that's what we mean by holding. So yeah, he's like, oh, I got to get my wife in here. I said, oh yeah, what's, uh, what's going on with your wife? Oh, nothing. She just, you know, she just doesn't really, she's never been checked and adjusted. And, and I think she should just come in and, and make sure that she's okay. So that in 20 or 30 years, her spine's healthier than, right. than it would be if she doesn't. And so you get people like that who really get it. And then you get people who obviously are coming in to try to help manage a, a symptom that they have. They'll, you know, maybe have migraines and, and come in when they start to have migraines. And then people who just know when they're off because they can feel how their body relates in gravity or maybe their vision goes off or maybe their personality. I had a guy come in just last week again. He hadn't been under, he'd been under care for more than a couple of decades actually transferred to me from another upper cervical chiropractor but he's been under my care for sure for um, since I started practice and he hadn't been in for two years and he was doing great and then all of a sudden he started noticing that he his personality was having greater trouble controlling his annoyance and irritation emotionally and then he remembered that that was something that had been affected historically with being his upper neck having a problem. So he came in, was assessed, he was off. He wasn't off by a lot, but he was off a little bit. I adjusted him. I mean, that guy used to be on a six month schedule before. He just kind of missed four appointments really when it <laughs> comes down to two years. But 
you know, and then I checked him a few days later, personality's back, he's like, ah, oh, so great to not have that sort of layer of darkness that I felt. And he was holding, so he didn't need to be adjusted. So again, all the objective findings were there and, uh, and looking good. And so it's so beautiful when you're focusing in the upper cervical spine, because you, by default, know you're not going to help anybody with everything. So, but you can help anybody with potentially anything. And uh, you don't know what it is that's going to be affected because the body being a self-healing, self-maintaining organism, we end up with this ability, if we remove this interference, for the body to just function better. Definitely. With almost everything. Yeah, that's a big thing with me too. When I'm out of alignment, I get depressed for no reason and very anxious. I can't control my anxiety. The moment I get put back into alignment, gone. And I'm just like, it reminds me why I do it. It's, yeah. it's pretty unbelievable. It's so amazing. A few years ago, when the uh, first diplomate in chiropractic craniocervical junction procedures was starting, and I had a chance to study with people who had mastery in different procedures, it was really amazing because you and I, for instance, we do different procedures for the upper neck mm -hmm. as base procedures, but we recognize that there is only one true biomechanical situation that's happening in a person at a particular point in time, and our job is to try to understand that to the best of our ability. And if you and I look at an upper cervical spine and we see different things that are a problem, then that means our procedures haven't developed far enough, right? So none of our procedures have yet developed far enough. And a lot of what I'm doing now within the, the practice of upper cervical chiropractic is really integrating those procedures as much as possible, but with using regular x-ray, but also with using... Uh, CT and MR, specifically cone beam CT, being able to look at these things in these different ways. When I started practice, and again, it's not that long ago when I started, you know, 16 years ago, but one of the things that I did was I looked back and I tried to say what different conditions, I did a very thorough case history and I would just watch different physiologic things that people would note or, or different symptoms that they would have. But one of the ones that I used to talk about a decade ago was uh, nosebleeds. I noticed a consistent improvement people would report <laughs> in nosebleeds, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And I was like, well, look at this guy. He's like, why do you think this is? And nobody really had any idea. And then in 2007, Marshall Dickholz Sr., who's since passed on, uh, really published a landmark a pilot study on the effects of the upper neck on blood pressure. It speaks to kind of our perspective on this as well, because it made a huge change in these people's blood pressure and the control group, no real change. And it was sustained very little intervention once that interference was removed. And so from a regular medical perspective, then NUCA then becomes or upper cervical could become a treatment for hypertension, Definitely. which would be then the condition, right? Yeah. In an upper cervical perspective, what we would say is we would say, well, you know, what happens is when the upper neck is misaligned, it wreaks so much havoc neurophysiologically in the body that to deal with that, the blood pressure is raised. Yeah. Right? And then removing that interference normalizes. Yeah. So it's not that the normal is the hypertension right. that has to be reduced. It's that it's an abnormal adaptation to something that's going on. And once that something is removed, yep. and in that study, there were, I'm not looking at it, and it's been a while since I've looked at it, so I don't want to misquote it, but I, there were 25, I'm pretty sure there were 25 subjects that had the intervention, 25 subjects that didn't. And the average reduction in the systolic, or the big number of blood pressure, the pressure that happens when your heart is fully contracted, pushing blood into your arteries, uh, was a 17-point drop. And on the diastolic, the amount of pressure that's in those same vessels when your heart is fully relaxed, or the bottom number of the blood pressure reading, it was like a 9-point drop. And that was the mean of all 25 people. What the really interesting thing from a chiropractic perspective about that is, I think, so when you look at the data, only 15 of the 25 actually had any change in their blood pressure. So the mean across the 25 was 17, but that's of 15 having a change and 10 having no change. And so when you look at NUCA as a treatment for hypertension, again, it speaks to the validity, I think, of our construct where we say, hey, we're not treating hypertension. We're just normalizing something right. because when you look at the percentages of that, there was a majority of people who had a change of that group, but it certainly wasn't all of them. It wasn't even remotely close to all of them, Yeah. right? And I think when you look, you say, well, look at that. Only 60% of the people had a change. Yeah. 
and yet the average change was 17 points. That means that 60% had a much bigger change on average if you just looked at them. As we start to look at the MRs and we start to have imaging that shows us what's going on, we start to then understand that, wait a second, what's happening with these type of major neurological events in people? And we start to say, okay, so we start to develop conjecture, you know, some thoughts around what might be happening. And the first thing that was thought within our organization, because there'd been some history, case reports about what might happen with blood pressure, we thought arteries were sort of beating on nerves and maybe making a problem. And what it ended up being, when we started looking at some case studies, was it appeared to be veins that were backing up that were the problem. It wasn't the arteries that were beating on the nerves. It was the backing up of the veins. So the veins on... Now, you have to understand, looking at MRIs is like listening to the radio. You're on the East Coast, and you probably got a lot of radio stations around you. Yeah. And if you um, are listening to a rock station, the likelihood of you hearing Blake Shelton mm -hmm. is almost non-existent. You could listen every day, forever, <laughs> yeah. and you're never going to hear Blake Shelton. And if you're on a country station, the likelihood of you hearing ACDC is like absolutely not going to happen, absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. And so people will come in as patients, I had an MRI and it showed nothing. And I'm like, well, you know, were you listening to a country station looking for a rock band, right? Yeah. Like what MRI did you have? So for these MRIs, you need what's called a phase contrast MRI. And there's not many people in the world who actually understand enough to interpret these MRs, uh, let alone take them. In fact, in Calgary, I've had uh, a sequence called the Scholten sequence. They named it because I was the first one to ask for it. Not that I came up with it. I just got it from Scott Rosa and, and uh, Julie Hunt and David Harshfield and asked them to do it. And so they did it, and uh, we integrated that, and we've been doing that for two years in the upper neck. And uh, they keep missing things on it, and so I send it off to another radiologist for a read for a second opinion, and then we get a different opinion for the patient, and they get the dignity of the proper diagnosis because we have the images. But there's this is a, radio, a radiological group that has 300 radiologists, and I'm talking to the head guy on neuromuscular imaging. He's like, Jeff, I wanted to upgrade the imaging. We, the literature had suggested that we needed to make it even better than what we had created two years ago. So I'm talking to him, trying to have him make it better. And he said, we're really in a medical legal quandary here because if I take these images, we don't have an expert that's expert enough to read it, to interpret it, right? To give you an appropriate opinion about it. And you don't have enough patience for me to dedicate a radiologist to learning about it because if they learn about it and you send me 10 patients a year, they have to relearn it every year because radiology is about repetition. That's how we don't miss things. So now we're working on a, a study so that they can take the images. We have to get a study passed through an ethics review board. And now they'll be able to take the images and I'll be able to send them off to a different radiologist in Florida who has the expertise to read it as long as they're working under some sort of what is called an institutional review board in Canada. And, it, and so it's interesting because patients will come in, they'll, they're from Calgary, they've had MRI imaging in Calgary, and they're telling me that there's nothing there. But right. what I know is that they haven't had the imaging to, they're li listening to the wrong radio station to find even what they think might be the problem. Yep. And so coming all the way around to this nosebleed concept hmm. that I had said earlier, you know, when you think about all the blood backing up in the veins, and if you understand the way the heart works, pushing blood into big vessels to small vessels on the artery side, and then through capillaries or capillaries into the vein side or, or the venous return side, you know, if that vein side is expanded and tortuous and full of blood, then you're kind of probably a lot of people are having backup in their skull and brain and therefore face and nose of blood vessels. And so then if a blood vessel is more full, you can imagine that it's more likely to blow and in a pressure change situation, maybe create a nosebleed for that person. That was probably the first time that I had that recognition. It was probably around 2010. But in 2004 was when I did the retrospective analysis and I knew about the nosebleeds. So you know about the nosebleeds in 04, you start to see some bit of the imaging in 2010, and then we start to understand how these conditions relate to each other. And that's really the essence of, I think, the early stages of scientific inquiry is this observation, right? And then we have to move up this if people really cared about nosebleeds, and that was a major reason why uh, that was negatively affecting their lives, it might take a higher priority than it currently does. Because 
what we're dealing with are people who have major issues with uh, what we would term craniocervical syndrome, which is what you and I treat, which is, you know, they'll have pounding headaches at the base of their skull, they'll have dizziness, they'll have vision disturbances, they'll have hearing disturbances, they'll have extremity numbness, they'll, have, they'll hit walls when they walk, and it's all different levels because this continuum, again... Here's the thing. The continuum is normal to dead, right? So normal is no injury to the upper neck. Dead is catastrophic injury. So if you're on that continuum, you know, our job as people who deal with this area is we're never going to make it normal again because once it's been injured, just like if you've cut yourself anywhere at any age, you can still see the scar. It's not going to be normalized. But the question is, can we move it into a zone or up that continuum far enough so that it's not negatively affecting that human being's life in a significant way. Right. You know, just like you, when you say, I feel anxious and, and depressed and dark when I'm subluxated and I get adjusted and I don't feel that way. Yeah. It's like you probably have to get adjusted periodically. The job is how infrequently can you have that happen? Right. And that's about us as chiropractors doing our job as well as possible, but also us recognizing that there are other professions that that are doing things that influence what we're doing and us taking the time to understand them and stewarding proper interfaces with those professions and stewarding proper referrals to them. You know, I always say to my patients, treatments are like socks and shoes. Often there's a particular order that works best. <laughs> and so just because you've tried something in the wrong order, don't say socks don't work because you put on the shoes and then the socks and then they you burn right. through them, right? Like you just didn't know what order to do it in. And right. our job is to help you know that. Yeah. Well, that especially goes with upper cervical because we are usually the last people that this person has seen. They tried physical therapy. They tried other chiropractic. They tried standard West Western uh, medicine and nothing has worked. And then they get under our care and then they notice that the physical therapy starts working again. The acupuncture starts working again. The massage starts working again. So that's also, that's a, that's a very interesting point you just brought up. 100%. The opposite happens too, Kevin. Very you true. Know, most of the time you're 100% in, in terms of what's going on. But sometimes I have a situation where let's say somebody's got an issue that they've been dealing with and I can get them adjusted and it can help them, but they don't hold. Mm -hmm. Maybe hold for a week or something like that. And uh, it, that can be very frustrating for somebody when they can get a glimpse yeah. of what it's like to not have these issues and, and to have their health back, but not have their health back enough that they have an adaptive capacity to deal with significant stress. Right? So they keep losing it. It's kind of like blowing a fuse. you got to have enough bandwidth, I guess, for you and I to be talking right now. And you have to have enough capacity to deal with the stressors that happen. So there are, there's a percentage, and that percentage is what drives me. I was talking to a group of dentists in New Orleans a couple of years ago, and they cornered me in the bar the night before I talked, and we we're chatting, and you know, they're talking about their miracle cases, and they have a many miracle cases. And, you know, when I got the stage for a couple of hours the next day, it's like, we could talk about our miracle cases, but the truth is, what drives the majority of us that are driven to make a difference. And I feel like you're driven to make a difference. But what drives us aren't that, in my retrospective analysis, 80% of people notice the 70 to 100% improvement in one of their chief complaints. I mean, like those are good stats, right? But that means 20% didn't. And we had 6% that noticed no difference in any symptom that they were experiencing. Now, we're not necessarily feeling that that's a failure because again, we're just dealing with the upper neck and might not be the cause of the symptom. But the thing is that there's a percentage of people who we do have the major cause of what's going on with them, but we can't stabilize them. And that drives me out into the integrative care world to understand what people are doing. And as a young new practitioner, my advice always, get out there, meet the other practitioners, understand why what they're doing works. You know, when we're talking to each other, let's not start from the perspective that what you're saying is wrong. But let me look from the perspective is, let's say what you're saying is right. Why is it right? What's right about it? And how does that make sense to me? And how, what parts of that fit for me? And what questions do I have yeah. to be able to understand? Jeff, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I remember when you were speaking at the conference, you told like you would be in a room full of doctors and all it takes is one guy in the room to be like, oh, I don't believe in that. I don't believe what you do. And some people will get offended and walk away and you guys won't have a conversation but I like the way, I like how you approach that situation on how to debate. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Because I took a lot away from that. I found that fascinating. Well, that's, I'm so happy to hear it because that's not an original idea of mine. I was taught that actually in my very first semester at chiropractic college in a neurophysiology class. A guy 
was saying, uh, the prof at the time, there's physiologic truth and then there's opinion. And when you don't have fact, you have opinion. And when you have an opinion, you should always be open to that opinion not being correct. You not having the right opinion and maybe you changing your opinion. Because when, when we're doing scientific inquiry, you know, evidence doesn't prove things, it informs an opinion. And it needs to be flexible and it needs to change with new evidence. And so what he said is if anybody ever disagrees with you about something, what I recommend you do is find out everything about what they disagree with you about (laughs) before you decide to start talking to them about things. Because you might find at the end of all of that that you actually agree with them and you disagree with your original opinion, which then you don't have to argue with them. And you've learned something. Or if you still disagree with them, you've learned everything that they disagree with about you and then you can inform your conversation back to them yeah right and so that's i like to do that and i've done that over the years a lot and so it's like i disagree with that my next question is always okay what do you disagree with yeah you know what about it do you disagree with what's your perspective on this tell me more share more about it and then they do and what that ends up doing is multiple things it informs you as i said but when you tell me you disagree with me about something and i say well that's stupid (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I come back and tell you back that why you shouldn't disagree with me. I'm not listening to you, and so you're not listening to me. And so we're going to likely come to an impasse. Yeah. But when I say, tell me why you think that, and you just tell me everything you think about it, and you feel very heard by me, then you're mostly, most people who want to learn stuff, because not everybody does, yeah. you know? Not everybody actually wants to learn. They, they just want to you know, make a problem. Some people are like that. But I think the vast majority of people want to learn and want to agree with others and be conciliatory and and amiable, you know? Mm -hmm. Even the heaviest drivers, like even the heaviest drivers, they just want to be heard and then you hear them and then you just shoot it right back at them and they hear you and they could change their opinion. But they're ready to hear you once you've heard them. And it's kind of like that, uh, what's that, the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would like them to have you know, but it's really the one step above that. I think is the platinum rule: do unto others as they would like to have done unto themselves. You know? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's kind of like try to figure out what people would want in a situation where you recognize, when you're in a circumstance like that, you recognize that that person is part of the small percentage of people that aren't interested in learning. You say, you know, you've heard them, and then you say, hey, you know, I I hear what you're saying, and, and this is what I hear, and I have a bit of a different perspective. Would you like to hear mine? And they don't want to hear yours. Then that's okay. Yeah. Like those can be one-time conversations. You don't have to be the person that uh, makes that person a more valuable member of society. They they've got big problems that they're dealing <laughs> yeah. with all the time because their ego is such that they can't hear from other people anything other than what they already believe. Or right. they've had some other challenges or maybe they just aren't ready to hear it at that time and maybe they'll hear it on another day. Yeah. I think that for all of us, as we try to understand things, listeners of yours that don't necessarily understand, even as you said, what NUCA is or how that works or what Blair is or what upper cervical is or how it might interface, you know, they might have a tendency to be like, oh, that's impossible. That's too good to be true. It's our job to make sure that we put a dose of reality in there. It's not like everybody's a miracle. I'd say in my practice, the home runs are probably 10 to 15 percent. And by home run, I mean, person's coming in, they're suffering really, really badly. And they've been suffering really badly for a long time. And we adjust them and it instantly changes. And it's probably about, you know, again, based on my historical research is 6% that have no symptomatic change. But there's very few that we can't actually help in an objective way. And even those that don't get a symptomatic change in our office will often want to continue care because they can see the difference that it makes in their life and they intellectually understand it. Not everybody's like that. But when any of the people who are on this listening to this that have a health problem, the, the key thing to understand about health is that when we're looking for a single solution, we rarely find it. And I think in the 10 to 15% that we hit the home run, What's happened is they've put a number of pieces of the puzzle in place, and I was just the icing on the cake to mix metaphors, you know. I put the last couple pieces in and they could everything came around. Whereas in the people that we don't make any kind of symptomatic change, what I think is we're putting some pieces of the puzzle in place because we're helping them. I mean, we can objectively see that we're helping them. Otherwise, we wouldn't even start. We wouldn't continue if we didn't see some objective results. But if their condition doesn't respond favorably to what we're dealing with, that it doesn't necessarily mean that those pieces of the puzzle weren't important. You might need to keep those pieces of the puzzle as you search 
hopefully with the help of your clinician, for the other pieces that are necessary to put in, right? Yeah, definitely. So that's how we practice here in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. I know that a lot of us practice that way, upper cervically. There's some who still practice with, they don't really monitor symptoms at all. And they try to not have people talk about their symptoms. But really, I think that physiology and symptomatic expression and understanding what people are experiencing is an important piece, as important as the objective Maybe not as important, but because you can't guide your care with the symptomatic right. pieces, but you can inform your care. Absolutely. And you got to be strong enough in your beliefs and your objective test things like you don't need an adjustment today, but I hear you. And it's almost good for them just to give a little, get a little bit off their chest, tell you how they're doing. And like you said, some people just want to be heard. And there is a fine line to that. You know, some people will talk forever, but some people just want to be heard. And that goes a long way, way with them too. So uh, Jeff, what are you doing now? So People that are listening to this, and there's not many upper cervical doctors in the world, you're putting together a website, correct, that's linking all the upper cervical techniques where people can go and find the nearest upper cervical technique near them? Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's a, we're doing actually quite a bit. So right now in upper cervical, I have a few different roles. I mean, I've, I'm on a research board called the Upper Cervical Research Foundation. I'm, uh, I'm president of NUCA right now, the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Association. I'm past president of the Upper Cervical Council of the International Chiropractic Association. And so I'm still on that board and as a board member, but I serve my couple terms as president. And in addition to that, what I'm really passionate about is the idea that still Students coming out of school with heavy loans and such might be able to come out and land in practice and be mentored in the development of their clinical skills and then uh, find themselves a way to be in practice and own their own practice and over the course of a six to 10 year period. And so what I'm working on is a multi-pronged approach to that. That's the big picture. The little picture is that there's a need for upper cervical chiropractors to find each other and that's uppercervicalcare.com. So any upper cervical chiropractor can get a free listing on there. And so therefore we can find each other with a little greater ease. We just want to have everybody listed who defines themselves as an upper cervical chiropractor and then they can verify verify themselves and they can have higher grade listings if they want. The other piece to that is that upper cervical chiropractors need good material for communicating and so we have upper cervical stuff which is branded reasonably generically as upper cervical care but it's really beautiful stuff made by Billy Doherty and so that's upper cervical stuff. And then we've got Healthy Chiropractice, and Healthy Chiropractice is uh, resources, business resources for upper cervical chiropractors. And so as you move up the different membership rankings of Healthy Chiropractice, you have different resources that are available to you. Some things, when you do it by yourself, it's much more expensive than if you do it as a group. And so certain things relative to business are organizations for technique. I believe the Blair organization is very strong right now. Nuka is very strong, but they're not really about business. They need to be about procedures and technique and research. And so we need organizations that focus on helping chiropractors with good ethical business systems that are focused on upper cervical chiropractic so that people don't have to go out and adapt business models from mainstream chiropractic to try to make them work in upper cervical because as somebody who consults with chiropractors regularly, I see some just terrible suggestions and uh, terrible advice that they get. So healthy chiropractice is there. A long time upper cervical patient advocate, somebody who funded The Power of Upper Cervical, which is a movie that you might have seen. I have, yeah. I love that. Yeah. A guy named Greg Buchanan. So he is in this group with me. So there's a few owners of this group right now. It's basically myself, uh, Carrie Johnson, who's an upper cervical practitioner in Minneapolis, Julie Mayer Hunt, who's in uh, Tampa. Yeah, you I've, might know. I've heard great things about her. Yeah, Thad Vanyo, who's outside of St. Louis. Greg Buchanan, who is upper cervical advocate. And then there's a bunch of people involved, like Amy Holiday, who's in the southeastern United States. Joey Miles, who's in the southeastern United States. Tony Monin, who's up in the northern United States, like Ohio. But a lot of us are working together. And there's other people who are more peripherally involved that are lending support to this idea, this collaborative idea. But what we want to have is we want to have a, um, through Greg Buchanan, is something we're creating called Friends of Upper Cervical, which when people are experiencing health condition that they're trying to have treated through upper cervical, they currently don't have 
have a lot of uh, support groups or those kinds of things or resources to get to because there's so few of us and we're spread so far apart. But what we want is for those patients to be able to find each other and uh, advocate for each other and uh, support each other and contribute to public awareness and contribute to research and have a landing place for that. So that's in development right now. We also have Transition to Success, which is Blair Schmaus in Edmonton is involved with, Tad, who's Kerry Johnson's associate in Minneapolis, Callan Stittleberg in uh, Rochester, Minnesota, and Amy Holiday, who I already mentioned, they're heading this transition to success. So we need a place where students, when they're interested in upper cervical, can find the resources to teach themselves and teach each other. That's kind of non-technique biased. So that uh, gives them information on techniques. So we're working with the council on upper cervical care and um, healthy chiropractors on the business of it and bringing those things to them in a really clean, non-solicitous way, right? And then uh, again, as the transition, allowing people to find associateships or landing opportunities like you've done, you're taking over a practice suit. So you need to be able to land and train and you need to be able to stay there and grow your practice and help people and put down roots. And so those are the basic pieces of what we have right now which will eventually create basically funding for chiropractors because banks can't pick successful chiropractors, but I think we can. We can have metrics on chiropractors, kind of like baseball cards, and understand what they've done during an associateship. And then we can, instead of each of us taking the chance on maybe one associate, putting them in a new practice, maybe we could have a thousand different people microfinancing a practice and an investable opportunity. So I like that. that's, that's where that's, we're that's going in amazing. the next 10 years. That's a great idea. Yeah. Well, we're working on it and it's a labor of love, but it, you know, again, it's just about finding the needs that exist out there in our world so that in 10 years, it's better than it is today. Cause it's certainly better today than it was 10 years ago Absolutely, because of yeah. the efforts of everybody. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. Well, Jeff, thank you so much. I, uh, I appreciate it. you're an inspiration to me. I uh, definitely would love to have a practice like yours someday. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and everything. And actually, the uh, I wrote the introduction to this podcast right after I heard you speak. And one of the things I will always take away from what you said is leave everything better than you found it. And I think that's exactly what you're doing with all the work you're providing and you're just making huge steps in the right direction and uh, making a huge difference. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure today. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Kevin. And you're doing awesome. Keep doing everything that you're doing to contribute to the world. And you're leaving it better than how you found it as well. So thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for listening. My private practice is located in New Jersey at Montclair Upper Cervical Chiropractic. If you have any additional questions about today's podcast, other episodes, or any questions about Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractic in general, feel free to visit my website at drkevinpecka.com or subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dr. Kevin Pekka. Hope you enjoyed the show. Cheers.